For the past three years, I've been trying multiple ways of trying to get people to understand the simple fact, yes, there are very big, powerful people that own and control this world, but they are nothing without our active or passive participation in their game. But this is a reoccurring process that has happened over and over again throughout history, and that while the names and faces and races have changed over the years, there is one common theme that has happened throughout all of history, and it is that, that cunning men consolidate power by spreading lies down to the masses to get them to willingly or unwillingly sacrifice their power up to the men that own and control that paradigm. What once started as the raping and pillaging of men like Genghis Khan soon turned into religious oligarchs getting the masses to sacrifice up to a god, which oh by the way empowered those that had the special knowledge at the top. Then some cunning men got the idea that they were divine rulers, and that the masses needed to support them either through serfdom or taxation. And when there was not enough wealth to support these greedy men, they set about colonizing other nations to steal from them. And still other cunning men got the bright idea to throw out the religious and royal oligarchs and fool the masses into worshipping the state, which then enriched the cunning men that were at the top of that scheme. And then we got to World War II, where the United States defeated all those and was the sole inheritor of the world. The United States came out of World War II relatively unscathed, while the rest of the world's productive capacity was decimated. But the cunning men that were at the top of this system started to panic, because now the rest of the world was destroyed, and without further war, there was no need for such manufacturing. The domestic population of the United States had learned sacrifice in living well below their means, and with the massive debts that the war produced, without a new expansion into a new area, the whole scheme would fall apart once again. Then came along a very cunning man named Edward Bernays, that was Sigmund Freud's nephew. He introduced a new twist to the game called consumerism, where he would get people to buy things that they did not need with money that they did not have. This was a perfect complement to our debt-based monetary system. There is the story of a New England farmer with a small pond in his pasture. Each summer, a group of wild ducks would frequent that pond. Try as he would, the farmer could never catch one. No matter how early in the morning he approached, no matter how carefully he constructed a blind, or what kind of duck call he tried, somehow those crafty birds sensed the danger and managed to be out of range. Of course when fall arrived, the ducks headed south, and the farmer's craving for a duck dinner only intensified. Then he got an idea. In the spring he started scattering corn along the edge of the pond. The ducks liked corn, and since it was always there, they soon gave up on dipping and foraging for food on their own. After a while, they became used to the farmer and began to trust him. They can see he was their benefactor, and now they walk close enough to him with no sense of fear. Life was so easy they forgot how to fly. But soon it was unimportant, because now they were so fat they couldn't have gotten off the water even if they tried. Fall came and the ducks stayed. Winter came and the pond froze. The farmer built a shelter to keep them warm. The ducks were happy because they didn't have to fly. The farmer was especially happy because each week, all winter long, he had a delicious duck dinner. That is the story of the America's Great Depression and our future. Wild horses used to roam the countryside free and independent. The same process man used to domesticate the horse is the same process the elite have done to enslave humanity and proved to be very successful for the next 60 years as the world latched on to the new religion of consumerism. Welcome to for the next 19 hours, we input orders, tray food, fan drinks, obstacle condiments, wipe tables, and bin garbage, all done in strict adherence to first catechism. What is the first catechism? Honor thy consumer. The baby boom generation that came out of post-World War II era embraced debt like there was no tomorrow. While this generation initially rebelled against the establishment with their sex, drugs, and rock and roll in the 60s and 70s, by the time the 80s had rolled around, they had bought in hook, line, and sinker into the American dream of consumerism, sacrificing family for careers, embracing debt, and chasing the American dream. This generational surge was only made possible by the relative peace of the post-World War II era, massively expanding energy production that coincided with the baby boom and the debt explosion. But only now are Americans starting to realize that what they sacrificed so much for was a lie. 
Your generation is definitely not headed for bingo night. In fact, you could write a book about how you're going to turn retirement upside down. And what I do is when people come in, I greet them. With this new religion of consumerism, no longer do people have to sacrifice for heaven. They could get instant gratification by simply buying things. No longer did it matter what kind of character or morals or empathy that one had. People now became identified by what they had and what they did to earn those things. As humanity tried to keep up with the Joneses, they slowly found themselves that they were in a rigged game. The things that they thought that they owned ended up owning them. What was expensive and fashionable one year was worthless and old the next. And yet the debts continued to mount and the profits rolled in for the next big thing. And while everyone you know may own the fanciest clothes, and the best cars, you will own the companies that sell them. If you want to know what heaven really is, Murray, try being God. These debts and profits funded the war machine that then went out to seize the natural and human resources of the rest of the world. Once conquered, the bankers and the corporations came in to harvest the natural and human resources of the world. These profits were then funneled through Wall Street that used their profits to manipulate the political system and media to ensure that the game is continually rigged. The sad fact is that this consumeristic world made debt slaves out of the consumers only to buy goods from slaves in other countries. And at the top of every system are the cunning men that created, perpetuated, and profited off of these paradigms. Because of these debts, our careers, and our service to this paradigm, we have empowered the worst in humanity that simply wants more power, more control, more domination. See, I find that everybody has a number, and it's usually an exact number. So what is yours? More. Instead of cultivating this earth into a better place, we have seeked to exploit for the quickest profit. It is said that the average American family produces five pounds of garbage per day. The scary fact is that it is estimated that 70 times that amount of garbage is produced in the manufacturing and transportation of that garbage. And for what? We have a world today that has awesome technical knowledge to be able to develop a $69 million hypersonic autonomous kamikaze bombs that can strike anywhere in the world within minutes, and yet we have a society that cannot become conscious to the fact that they are slaves living depressing, malnourished, narcissistic little lives. Well, who cares if we can technically watch a 3D, 80-inch, high-definition TV instantly downloading the latest Kardashian show dressed in a Prada spacesuit while driving a Mercedes moon buggy on the moon? On your deathbed, will you be thinking about all the technical things that you were able to do or the idealistic relationships and passions you did not pursue? I can tell you what Steve Jobs wished for. He wished he could have gotten to know his kids better. All of the technical progress we have made in war, communication, finance, government, and consumer gadgets are worthless if those lives that are building, consuming, and dying for these goods are soulless creatures who do not think for themselves. And what is the result of all this technical thinkers manipulating our world? We have rigged the world to blow with massive financial fraud that will technically end the world as we know it. And for what? Do we technically live better than we did 50 years ago? And by what measure? Happiness, obesity, education, divorce? We need the ability to ask why we do things and not how to technically do things. Maybe then we can ask why we should even build a hypersonic bomb. Does it make the world better? Who does it benefit? How would these resources be better used? And do we even have the right to take from some to destroy others? Without a greater sense of life behind our technical actions, we will continue this painful existence on Earth. You cannot change the outside world to become free or happy. You must change yourself to become free and happy. Most of the stuff that we buy, we don't even use a week later. If you try to sell it at a garage sale, it's only worth five cents on a dollar. And yet we still continue to play into this game. We go to work to buy more stuff, and then we feel bad, and go to work and buy more stuff, and then we feel bad. This negative loop will end at some point, and it will most likely come when the dollar collapses. As consumerism has spread throughout the United States, it has turned the landscape of this country into one gigantic strip mall, replacing cultural identity with brands. This has led to a massive misallocation of wealth, because nearly 70% of the U.S. economy is now revolving around consumer debt. And the sad fact is that the rest of the economy is controlled by the government 
through either Wall Street regulation, military spending, or now Obamacare. When the market realizes the misallocation of this capital, there will be a massive reversion to the mean, and everything that had value during this debt and death paradigm will be completely worthless. Those people who are making the most amount of money during this time period offer no real tangible value to humanity whatsoever. Think of the CEOs, the lawyers, the lobbyists, the military contractors. They are parasitic creatures that have fed off the, the once healthy host of the United States. The sad fact is that most people don't have any real skills to produce any real wealth. The consumer model is all about shuffling papers around people and products and not creating real wealth. When the dollar collapses, all social, political, and financial contracts will be broken. And all that will be left are the real wealth, real skills, and real friends that we have. So if this makes you a little depressed, don't worry, they'll sell you a pill for that too. This Black Friday, we should remember that our religion is consumerism. Our Bible is the catalog. Our prophet is Edward Bernays. Our saint is Santa. Our church is the mall. Our pope is Ben Bernanke. Our high priestess is Oprah. Our communion is Starbucks. Our sacrament is shopping. Our high holy day is Black Friday. And our heaven is the sale. As I said, for the past three years, I've been trying to get people to understand the reality of our world. And sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. The right image at the right time is sometimes better than the best logical presentation that one can put forth. It is my hope with the Silver Bullet Silver Shield series to continue to put forth powerful images that resonate with people and change the consciousness of others, and also continue to put the real wealth in their hands that will be needed to shield them from the collapse of this debt and death paradigm. From there, it is my hope that we can build a better society from the ashes of this collapsed one, one that will be centered on real wealth, real skills, and real friends that cooperatively work together in equitable relationships to build a sustainable paradigm that will bring forth the natural abundance that is everywhere in this world. And maybe then we will finally see peace on earth. For the past three years, I've been trying multiple ways of trying to get people to understand the simple fact, yes, there are very big, powerful people that own and control this world, but they are nothing without our active or passive participation in their game. But this is a reoccurring process that has happened over and over again throughout history, and that while the names and faces and races have changed over the years, there is one common theme that has happened throughout all of history, and it is that, that cunning men consolidate power by spreading lies down to the masses to get them to willingly or unwillingly sacrifice their power up to the men that own and control that paradigm. What once started as the raping and pillaging of men like Genghis Khan soon turned into religious oligarchs getting the masses to sacrifice up to a god, which oh by the way empowered those that had the special knowledge at the top. Then some kind of The United States came out of World War II relatively unscathed, while the rest of the world's productive capacity was decimated. But the cunning men that were at the top of this system started to panic, because now the rest of the world was destroyed, and without further war there was no need for such manufacturing. The domestic population of the United States had learned sacrifice in living well below their means, and with the massive debts that the war produced, without a new expansion into a new area, the whole scheme would fall apart once again. The cunning men got the idea that they were divine rulers, and that the masses needed to support them either through serfdom or taxation. And when there was not enough wealth to support these greedy men, they set about colonizing other nations to steal from them. And still other cunning men got the bright idea to throw out the religious and royal oligarchs and fool the masses into worshipping the state, which then enriched the cunning men that were at the top of that scheme. And then we got to World War II, where the United States defeated all those and was the sole inheritor of the world. Then came along a very cunning man named Edward Bernays that was Sigmund Freud's nephew. He introduced a new twist to the game called consumerism, where he would get people to buy things that they did not need with money that they did not have. This was a perfect complement to our debt-based monetary system, 
There is the story of a New England farmer with a small pond in his pasture. Each summer, a group of wild ducks would frequent that pond. Try as he would, the farmer could never catch one.